In secret laboratories and on military proving grounds the world over, engineers have sought to make these guns more powerful, more accurate, and more deadly. Of all weapons in the artillery arsenal, perhaps none is more awe-inspiring than the big gun. These are the super cannons on the field of war, shooting higher and farther, forever changing the course of battle and history. The story of super guns dates back more than 500 years when cannons first appeared on the battlefield. It must have made a tremendous impression the first time people who were used to bows and arrows found themselves being attacked by projectiles that didn't need muscle power to throw them, but was thrown by this new chemical device, which was gunpowder. As cannons grew larger and more accurate, improvements in gunpowder increased their range, but the mechanics of artillery remained virtually unchanged for more than 500 years. The standard guns of the American Civil War were loaded, aimed, and fired much the same as were its ancestors from the 14th century. As the 19th century came to a close, however, artillery changed dramatically. The two key events of the 19th century as far as artillery is concerned, one is breech loading, the other is rifling. Small grooves in the inside of a gun's barrel called rifling caused artillery rounds to rotate, improving their range and accuracy. Rifling also allowed for heavier, more streamlined shells. Breech loading made refiring quicker and recoil systems allowed a gun to be fired without repositioning and re-aiming after every shot. The First World War saw modern, large-caliber, breech-loading artillery wreak destruction on a scale unimaginable in previous conflicts. The First World War was the great artillery war. It, it was a, a, a huge conflict, a, a struggle between two sides who were, had all of the technology of both of their societies ranged behind them. In the volatile political climate in Europe at the end of the 19th century, Belgium recognized its vulnerability and built a series of forts designed to withstand the most powerful field artillery of the day. Behind these forts, the small country was convinced of its security. The Belgians had no idea Germany was building a super gun beyond what anyone thought possible. Big Bertha took its name from Baroness Bertha Krupp, the granddaughter of Alfred Krupp, the German gunmaker. Originally designed as a coastal gun, the 42-centimeter howitzer weighed in excess of 40 tons. It was so immense that it had to be transported in pieces and assembled on site. In August of 1914, the Germans transported their super gun to the outskirts of the Belgian town of Liège, where 12 state-of-the-art forts guarded the border. Although nobody ever talks about the Kaiser's secret weapon, those 42-centimeter howitzers certainly were a secret weapon. And the fact that the Germans not only had two guns, but deployed them with a field army, guns of that size, was astonishing. The thing about the 42 centimeter howitzer is that it fired a shell, which is equivalent in weight to a small car, to a range of between six and seven miles at high angle, so that at the peak of its trajectory, the shell had the added assistance, the force of gravity. And if you can imagine the impact of that upon a brick building, it would probably pulverize it into small little bits of dust. Belgian forts were no match for the German super gun. Within three days, those that hadn't been destroyed were surrendered. The Big Bertha was a very effective weapon in uh, smashing forts. And it shocked everyone on the Allied side because these forts were considered artillery proof. 
From Liège, the massive guns moved through Belgium and into France with the same devastating effect. Five big berthas were eventually built and continued to rain destruction down on the Allies until the end of 1917, when their limited range made them targets for Allied counter-battery attacks. Still, the Germans had another supergun in the works, and it would change everybody's idea of the limits of artillery. At 7.18 on the morning of the 23rd of March, 1918, the peace in Paris was shattered by an explosion. The citizens thought it was an air raid, but no airplanes had been seen or heard. By the end of the day, there were 22 such explosions. 15 people lay dead, another 36 were wounded. Only when shell fragments were found and analyzed did French officials realize that airplanes were not responsible for the destruction. Paris had been the victim of a terrifying new weapon, a long-range super gun. It's understandable that this conclusion wasn't arrived at sooner. The best land artillery of the day had a range of about 23 miles, and the front was nearly 80 miles away. More than three years earlier, the German advance had stalled and the war ground to a bloody stalemate. The opposing armies dug in, casualties mounted. The German military commanders wanted to strike at the heart and soul of the enemy, not just their men at the front. Aerial bombing of Paris had proved costly and ineffective. In the autumn of 1916, the dilemma was taken to Krupp, the same company that made Big Bertha. In an amazing feat of engineering, a revolutionary long-range gun was made suitable for testing by the spring of the following year. The Kaiser Wilhelm Geschutz, known as the Paris gun, was fashioned by inserting a 21-centimeter liner into a 38-centimeter naval gun. Under this, a smooth board extension was added. The resulting barrel was some 34 meters long and weighed in excess of 140 tons. The gun was so long that a superstructure had to be erected to keep it from drooping. In quiet woods near the small French town of Crepy, the Germans built this gun emplacement, the remains of which are still visible today. An immense amount of pressure was needed to propel the shells 76 miles south to Paris. Now, that powder was so hot and the pressure was so high that every time the gun fired, it wore away because the flame temperature of the cartridge was hotter than the melting point of the steel. So each shell gradually increased in size and each shell was numbered. Deterioration of the barrels was so severe they had to be replaced each month. The Allies tried desperately to silence the big guns. Railroad artillery was brought closer to attempt counterfire, and air raids were called in, but to no avail. The guns were well camouflaged and moved periodically between concrete emplacements that held them. And the other interesting question is, if you're firing at a target 76 miles away, deep in enemy country, how do you know if you've hit it? And that was what was worrying the Allies. After the war, it was discovered that German spies in Paris were relaying details on where each of the shells landed through operatives in Switzerland and back to Germany. With this information, the gun crews could adjust their fire. From March to August of 1918, the super guns fired some 350 shells into Paris, killing 256 citizens and wounding over 600 more. After the war, the Allies rushed to the woods of Crepy to retrieve the German super gun. One of the great secrets of World War I was just exactly what happened to the Paris Schutz. When the French got in there, it was gone. The German government treated it as a state secret for well after the war and actually locked up some of their citizens up for, technicians up for releasing anything about it in 1926. 
The world may never know what became of the guns. All that remains are these concrete emplacements, mute witnesses to their mysterious disappearance. But 70 years later, the Paris guns would inspire the design of the greatest supergun of the century. The destruction wrought by big guns in the First World War echoed throughout the Second. Once again, both sides deployed large caliber artillery in the form of naval weapons, coastal guns, and railroad guns. But none could compare to the massive weapons secretly developed by the Krupp factory for the Third Reich. As an infantryman in the First World War, Adolf Hitler had observed the destructive capability of big guns firsthand. He was a firm believer in the power of artillery. Shortly after he was elected chancellor, he asked the Krupp company for a super weapon to penetrate the Maginot Line, France's deeply entrenched, heavily fortified first line of defense. At more than 1,300 tons, Gustav remains the heaviest gun ever made. Two trains were required to move the massive weapon in pieces. When it arrived on site, four specially designed railroad tracks had to be laid to accommodate the gun and the train needed to assemble it. While this was going on, two anti-aircraft trains were parked to protect it. A company of infantry were dispersed to protect it. It needed 1,250 men to man these trains, put the gun together and everything else. They took three weeks doing it. Gustav could fire either a 4.7-ton high-explosive shell to a range of 29 miles, or a specially designed 7-ton concrete piercing shell, 24 miles. But the engineering of such a colossal weapon system was more difficult than Krupp estimated, and Gustav was not completed for Hitler's push into France. It didn't see action until the siege of Sevastopol, Russia, in 1942. And the most spectacular one was when the anti-concrete shell went straight down into an underground magazine, naval ammunition magazine outside Sevastopol, and blew the thing sky high in one shot. After Sevastopol, Gustav was sent to Leningrad, but arrived too late to take part in the siege. There is little evidence that it ever saw action again. If you come right down to it, to spend millions of marks on a 1,300 ton cannon, which in the course of a five year war fired 25 shots, you're not really looking at something that you call cost effective, are you? Gustav, like the Paris gun before it, mysteriously disappeared. Parts were reportedly found in Russia and at the Krupp factory proving grounds. But after the war, all that remained was a spare barrel and some ammunition. By the fall of 1943, Germany occupied all of Western Europe. Only England stood between Hitler and total domination of the continent. Less than a hundred miles from the coast of France, London was a tempting but unreachable target for conventional artillery, and therefore the driving force behind the development of another German secret weapon. The high-pressure pump gun was a, a, a gun that um, had firing chambers on both sides of the main barrel. And the idea was that you started the round down the barrel and as the round would clear each one of these chambers on the side, it would fire, adding more and more gas pressure behind the round, thereby kicking the round out to very, very, very long ranges. The V3, also known as the Busy Lizzie, or the Millipede, was designed